be talking about Abraham, where would we go to Bob? Genesis. You would think, right? What testament would we go to? You would think. But actually, we're going to go to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. I know, that was a little tricky. You know, you guys need help once in a while, but sure. I don't want you to start nodding off from the very beginning. So Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 19. Hebrews almost toward the end of the New Testament. One of the very cool books of the New Testament, one that people just can't seem to decide on the authorship of. To me, I think it's incredibly fascinating. Most people tend to lean toward the Apostle Paul writing it, but there's been some other, well, there's been some very cool theories that have been posed. So starting in, starting in chapter 11, we're going to start with verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in a promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man... And as good as dead came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. And people who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. I love how this author just encapsulates the whole story of Abraham. Not the whole story, we'll get into a little more of it. But he gives you the, a really, really nice overview. But he keeps making the point, and all throughout this chapter in Hebrews, Faith, by faith, by faith. Believing what you cannot see. We all struggle with that. <clears throat> a man once told a story about his 84-year-old grandmother. Apparently, she fiercely maintained her independence. She could take care of herself. She didn't need any help. She lived alone in the old family home. She had four children. They lived in the same town, but she rarely called them except for emergencies. So it was with some apprehension Guy drove to her house one morning and answered to her phone call. And when he arrived, she said she suspected that there was a burglar in her bedroom closet because she had heard noises the night before. Last night. She said, yeah. I said, well, why didn't you call me last night? She said, well, it was late and I didn't want to bother you. So I just nailed the closet shut and went to bed. <laughs> and that's the kind, the example of the type of faith that we're reading about here in this chapter of Hebrews. A faith that nails the doors of doubt shut and then calmly leaves the rest to God. Amen. Imagine you had a, a burglar and he's hiding in your closet. You nail the door shut and then you go to sleep. You call your son in the morning. That's the kind of faith that God tells us Abraham had. So it impressed God that Abraham earned the title the father of all who believe. Romans 4 and so here in Hebrews 11, we're repeatedly told why Abraham was so highly regarded by God. Because he believed in an inheritance. 
one that he himself never received. He believed in a child that he was too old to follow. And when asked to sacrifice his own son as an offering, he believed that God could and would raise the boy from the dead. That's pretty impressive stuff. That's tough to believe all those things. And in fact, these reports about Abraham are so incredibly impressive that we could find it very difficult to relate to him. What a powerful man of God. We'd even be excused, maybe, we could say things, well, yeah, it was easy for Abraham to do that because he was different than me. I could never believe like that. I struggled too much with doubt. But God knew that. That's the beauty of this. And he knew that it would be hard for his people to relate to a, a superhero of faith. So God tells us a few things about Abraham that, well, Abraham would probably be happier if they had not ever been revealed about him. For example, in Genesis 12, 1, God told Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. Notice the part that says, leave your father's household. Well, Abraham didn't completely obey that command, did he? He took his nephew Lot along with him. I'm sure he regretted it because Lot caused him a lot of grief down the way. And, and this is something that we like to do in our lives. This was a little disobedience. But this little disobedience, well, it resulted in huge family conflict for generations. Conflicts between Lot's sheep herders and Abraham's. It got so bad that the time came when Abraham attempted to settle the matter. He gives Lot, he said, you have your choice of pasture land. You take one way, whichever way you leave, that's the way I'll take. You take your first choice. So Lot chose the greenest grass, which led up to the city of Sodom. And you know the rest of that story, right? There was the promise that God made Abraham that he would have a son. I'm going to give you a son, and this son through the Son, you will be the father of many, many nations. More numerous than the stars of the sky and the sands on the seashore. God made him that promise, and Abraham heard him make that promise. He, he may have believed it, but he had a hard time convincing his wife Sarah. They were both getting on in years, and Sarah talked Abraham into observing a very quaint custom of the day. She asked him to have a child by her handmaid, Abraham. The resulting offspring was a boy, his name was Ishmael, and before long his presence brought conflict into the home. Eventually Hagar and Ishmael were asked to leave. The boy grew into a man, he became the father of many nations himself, nations whose descendants have been enemies of the Jews from that day on. And, and of course, no story of Abraham would be complete without us telling you about the time he tried to pass his wife off as a sister. Genesis 12, 11, and 13 said, As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarah, I know what a beautiful woman you are. And she's probably thinking, well, that's nice of you to say it like that. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then he will kill me and let you live. At this point, I think she understood this was not a romantic conversation anymore. <laughs> Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. She agreed. People around probably thought that was a good idea. But God was not pleased with that decision. He did not like God at all. And he made it clear to Abraham that he wasn't happy about it. And the thing was, Abraham did it again. Once in Egypt and later in the city of Gerar. So why would this great man of faith, this superhero of faith, why would he try to pass his wife off as his sister? Because he was afraid. Oh wait, let's back up. He was afraid? He felt fear? Like a normal human being would, would feel? Mm. Yeah. Like you might feel sometimes. Like I feel sometimes. The man who was called the father of all who believed was so scared that he was willing to give up his wife so that he could live. That's embarrassing. Huh? Why would God tell us all these embarrassing stories about Abraham? Is he like the parent that threatens the uh, threatens to uh, pull out the old baby pictures whenever you know the kids uh, do 
A uh, boyfriend or girlfriend comes over? No, it wasn't anything like this. God, God tells us these stories. He shows the imperfections of Abraham. He does this for you and I. Because he wants us to see that this great man of God is not so much different than you. He's no different than me. He made mistakes. He struggled with his faith. He stumbled in his obedience. I mean, he, he groped in the darkness of insanity. In short, he was just like you and me. So how could God call this man, how could he call Abraham a great man of faith? The father of those who believe. This guy who obviously disappointed God on so many occasions. And those are just the ones that are written down. He fell so short of being the giant that we consider him to be. He made mistakes. His mistakes produced incredible consequences, many problems for God's people later on, even so still to this day. How could this man be such a great example of faith? I want to share with you this story. Years ago, when John Rockefeller was running a gigantic empire known as the Standard Oil Company, one of the employees made a disastrous decision and it cost the company $2 million. Fear swept through the company as everyone expected Rockefeller was going to have a fit, fire the man responsible, take his wrath out on all of them as well. And Edward Bedford, a partner in the company, he was scheduled to see Rockefeller that day. And as he entered, he saw the man bent over his desk and he was busily writing with a pencil on a pad of paper. And he stood silent. He didn't want to interrupt. And after a few minutes, Rockefeller looks up at him. He's out with you, Bedford, he said calmly. I suppose you've heard about our loss. Bedford said he had. He said, I've been thinking it over, and before I ask the man in to discuss the matter, I've been making some notes. And Bedford told the story later this way. He said, across the top of the page, he put, point in favor of Mr. And there underneath that title was a long list of the man's virtues including a, a brief description of how he had helped the company make the right decision on three separate occasions. And these decisions had earned the company many times the cost of his error. The man kept his job and Bedford left the meeting forever changed in how he viewed other employees of the company. You know, Rockefeller built an empire by not being a what have you done for me lately boss. And, and God is that way with you and I. He's not a what have you done lately for me God. But too often times, guys, as Christians, we are, what have you done lately for me, God, Christians? Mm. That's a sermon for another day. We'll be up today. A couple sermons. A couple sermons. Yeah. Yeah. So I told you that story because I want, I want you to understand how God viewed Abraham. And not only how he viewed Abraham, but how he views us. Yes. Abraham made mistakes. He messed up. He was not perfect. He failed God on a number of occasions. He had a past filled with miserable disappointments. But you see, God didn't look at Abraham to see his past. He looked at Abraham to see the man he could become. He looked at him to see his possibilities, his potential. Nobody is ever 100% sinless and pure. Every one of us is going to stumble somewhere along this path, just like Abraham did. But you see, there is something distinctly different about Abraham that I feel God wants us to know. Something that made him stand out above all the other people that God could have chosen. Thousands of others, and God picked Abraham to be the father of a great nation, the father of all those who believe. And this was all part of the redemption story. Please understand, because God has selected someone who would bring about the Messiah, eventually. The Messiah who would, through him, give the sacrifice that would, well, would fix everything. This was part of the Genesis 3.15 prophecy. Remember where he said, you have bruised his heel, but he will crush your head. This is the beginning of the head crushing mechanism. It's starting. So what was it about Abraham? He wasn't perfect. He believed God. 
He truly believed it. He may not have believed perfectly, but he believed God. And he didn't just believe that God existed. He believed everything that God told him. Hebrews 11, 6, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Now, when we say must believe in God, too many times we get too full of ourselves. Okay? And we think that we are doing God a great favor by acknowledging His existence. That's not what we're talking about here. This is not the supreme being that we are simply accepting begrudgingly that he exists. No. When you believe in God, when you believe that God exists, you have to believe everything that goes with it. That he created the world out of nothing. That he existed before time. That the whole concept of time he created as a convenience for his creation. The whole point of Believing in Him is that we believe that He made us out of nothing, that He made a way to repair our own unrighteousness and our own unholiness by sacrificing His Son that we may live. When we say we believe in God, you have to believe the whole thing. You can't just sanctimoniously say, yeah, I believe that God exists. I'm going back to bed. Yeah, I believe that God exists. I'm going to live my life any way I please because nobody can tell me what to do. I saw one of the funniest things on Facebook. I laughed so hard. It said, somebody said, only God can judge me. Somebody said, yes, and that should terrify you. Amen. And it's true. Both cases are true. Yes, only God can judge you. But yeah, that should scare you to death. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So notice what it tells us when it talks about Abraham and why he acted by faith. In Hebrews 11, 8, we're told, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Why would he do that? Because in Hebrews 11, 10, it tells us this, He was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. In other words, Abraham didn't care where he went, just so he went with God. Amen. God will lead you anywhere, but that whole point is not where you're going, it's who you're following. He didn't care if his home was nothing but a tent. He didn't care if he ever owned any more land than what he needed to bury his wife on. All Abraham cared about is God would be there. And how did he know that would happen. Isn't that the big question here? How did he know? How, how was he so sure? How was Abraham so certain of this? God made him a promise. Hebrews 11, 11, we're told, By faith Abraham, even though he was past age, and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father. Why would Abraham believe that? The rest of the verse. Because he considered him faithful who made the promise. In other words, Abraham never doubted he would have a son. And why was this? Because God had made the promise. You see, he not only believed in God, but he understood who God was. That God could not be God and break a promise. It went against the definition of what God is. It didn't make any sense that an old man like him with an elderly wife like Sarah could have children. Yeah, it made no sense at all. But it didn't matter if it made sense to a limited human mind. Right? God had made a promise. Hebrews 11, 17 and 18 were told, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who received the promises was about to sacrifice his own son, his one and only son, even though God had told him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Why on earth would Abraham be willing to do that? 11.19, did Abraham reason, reason that God could raise the dead? Now, 
granted, his relationship with Isaac might be a little strained after he had killed him on the altar, but <laughs> he believed he could raise him from the dead. So he, when you truly believe in God, when you truly believe that God is who he says he is, obedience just becomes a natural thing. Had Abraham ever seen the dead raised before? No. Had God promised that Isaac would be raised up from the dead? No. Then why would Abraham reason this way? God had made him a promise. And Isaac was going to be the son from whom a great nation would be. So the only thing that made sense to Abraham was I'm going to obey God and God will bring him back to life. It didn't make any difference that he had never seen the dead raised. God made a promise and it was up to God to figure out how Isaac could be offered as a sacrifice on some lonely hill and still become the father of many people. That was up to God to figure that out. How many times in our lives do we try to take that decision power and that reasoning power off of God? All the time, right? Okay, God, this is my mess. So I've got it all figured out on how you need to fix this for me. So, go! Yeah. And of course, the creator of the universe says, Oh, yes, sir, I'm right on. <laughs> you know, I mean, it sounds hilarious when I say it, right? It sounds ludicrous. But it's exactly what we do. God made a promise. That's all Abraham knew, and that's all he cared about. There's a lot of talk about blind faith, and it's a concept that makes people uncomfortable because it seems to be a faith that to almost oppose reason. And many people have a problem with it. I think a lot of times people misuse the term blind faith, and they try to use it as a previous statement that you're just going to believe that God is going to do things your way, the way he wants them, when you, when you want them done. But about the blind faith I'm talking about is a little different. I, I, I'm putting Abraham as the example of blind faith. He left his home and he obeyed God even though he had no, word, no idea where he was going. He believed he could have a son even when it defied all reality. And he believed that God could raise the dead even though he'd never seen it done before. All because he believed God. He believed who God was. And that's about as close as you can get to total faith. Mm -hmm. My point is this. There will come a time when we're all going to have to have that total faith. Amen. All the circumstances, all the facts, all the human reasoning around you will tell you that God cannot possibly do what he has promised to do. And you'll be left with nothing but your faith. Just like Abraham. And you're going to have to make a choice. Do you believe God, or do you believe what you can see, handle, and measure? And that's precisely how Abraham ended up in Hebrews 11. God made him the poster child of that kind of faith. Abraham, his life, it was the kind that took all the uncertainties of life, placed them to the side of the scales, and on the other side, he put simply and solely God. Just last week, I was reading about a fire department, and they were teaching safety and how to respond to potential dangers of a house fire. And the last of the three rooms in this mobile smokehouse where they had set up, they, they filled the room with this acrid white smoke to help the kids understand how disorienting a smoke-filled room can be. If you've ever been in such a room, you, you would understand. It's real hard to keep your bearings. It, you, you think you will, but you know you, you turn this. You think you turn this far, but you've actually turned this far. You, you think you're heading one direction, you're heading the other. Very disorienting. The parents sat there and they watched the children around and begin to fade from view as the well, smoke got thicker, thicker. And eventually, all they can see is my hands, and then they disappear from view. In his book, The Ragged Muffin Gospel. Brennan Manning tells about an incident. A two-story house caught on fire. And the family's making his way out of the house, but the smallest boy, he had become terrified. 
He tore away from his mother and of all things runs back into the house upstairs. Imagine being that his parents. Really? And then he appears at a smoke-filled window and he's crying hysterically. Smokes everywhere, flames, sirens, lights. It would be a scary thing, right? And standing outside, his father yelled, Jump, son, and I'll catch you. And the father goes, But daddy, I can't see you. Says, I know, his father called. You can't see me, but I can see you. Abraham may not have been able to see how it would all turn out, but he trusted his father's voice. Amen. Can't we? Amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you so much that we can hear your voice. And Lord, we thank you for, for men like Abraham, who, like us, were far less than perfect. God, we pray that you would help us to be more obedient to you. You would help us to help us to believe in you even deeply, more deeply than when our when our doubts start to rise up on us. Dear God, we pray that you would give us that that faith that you've given Abraham. And dear God, we pray that throughout all of the things we're going through now, let us never forget that you are always God and you are always in charge. It's in your name we pray.